In this video, you're gonna learn how to make your interactions look and feel better by using basic principles of animation. Disney's 12 basic principles of animation were introduced by Disney's animators Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas in their 1981 book called The Illusion of Life, Disney Animation. While this book was written with traditional animation in mind, these same principles can be translated into user interactions as well. And in this video, we're going to explore how these principles actually apply to interface animations. The examples in this video will be built using Webflow, but the same principles can be applied to any tool, no matter if you're using another platform, app, software, or if you're writing simple CSS and JavaScript. All right, now let's get started. The first principle that we're going to look into is anticipation. In traditional animation, anticipation is used to prepare the audience for an action and to make the action appear more realistic. In other words, anticipation prepares the user or the viewer to whatever is about to happen. A character bending her knees before a jump is anticipation. Now, how does that principle translate to interfaces? In interfaces, hover states are a great example of this. Whenever you hover over elements, certain elements react, indicating that they are clickable. Another way to create anticipation is to reveal the next element if the user can scroll horizontally. Next, we have squash and stretch. The purpose of squash and stretch is to give a sense of weight and flexibility to objects. Let's look at this bouncing ball. It looks like it's made from a very hard and heavy material right over here. Now, let's add some squash and stretch to the same ball and let's see how it looks. Suddenly, the ball looks very different. It looks much more elastic and, in fact, it looks even heavier, maybe. Now, the same principle can also be applied to user interactions and user interfaces. So, let's have a look at that. Now, here we applied squash and stretch to a sidebar. You can see we got a really nice effect from it. This same principle can also be applied to cards, loaders, and many other elements. Let's now have a look at how this squash and stretch animation was built. If we open our interactions panel here, you can see that we have this sidebar. We have the initial size of the sidebar, which is set to 64 pixels, and then here we set the width to auto. And all we have to do is set the easing to swing to, and we get this nice squash and stretch effect. It overshoots a little, and then it goes back to where it should be. And when the sidebar is collapsing, we did essentially the same thing, just the other way around. So the size changes back to 64 pixels, and it swings to that value. So it overshoots a little, and it goes back. Next, we're going to cover appeal and exaggeration. First, let's cover appeal. Important characters in a scene must be appealing. Now, when you think of appealing, don't think beautiful. Instead, think of something interesting or eye-catching. We can make things more appealing by increasing the contrast through color change, size change, or even through animation. We can even make things more appealing by using exaggeration. Now, let's cover exaggeration. The classical definition of exaggeration employed by Disney was to remain true to reality, just presenting it in a wilder and more extreme form. Let's see how these two principles can be used to highlight a button. Here we have two different buttons, and the one on the left is having more contrast, so it makes it automatically more appealing. Now, let's see how we can use exaggeration to make this button even more appealing. Let's scroll down to the bottom and here we animated it and it's sort of screaming at us to click on it just because it's animated and everything else on the page is static. If you're wondering how this interaction was made, we're essentially only changing the scale property of the button. Here you can see we're triggering this animation on page load and we are looping through it. So if you look at the interaction, it's essentially very simple. So we have the scale property, which changes and goes back to one. And that's it. Here, we don't even need an initial state. 
We could even delete that and it would still work the same. Now, obviously, if you would be using that on your site, you would want to stop the scaling from happening once a user hovers this button for the first time. Note that you also don't need to use Webflow interactions. You can achieve the same effect with just a few lines of CSS. And our next principle is staging. Staging is the presentation of any idea so that it is completely and unmistakably clear. Staging is a very broad principle, but it boils down to controlling where the viewer is looking. Let's look at an example of good and bad staging so that this idea becomes more clear. You can see here, we have an example of bad staging. If we hit preview, we can see we have this animation and everything sort of happens at once. We're not really guiding the user to look anywhere. Now let's look at the same design, but with good staging. So we have our staging example over here and we can see here how elements pop into the screen one by one. So we look here first, then here, and finally we look at the image. Let's look at it once again. Let's now look at how we built this interaction. You can see here that we have this initial state here for all of our elements on the page. Now here, we're first animating the headline. It's just moving up for 30 pixels or so, and we're changing the opacity from zero to 100%. We're doing the same here with this subtitle below here, and it's moving just a little bit less. And finally here we have our image, which moves from the left side of the screen to the right side. Note that this same principle can be used in so many other areas of your website. No matter if you're scrolling through sections, if you're having page transitions, or if you're building a pop-up. And our next principle is pose-to-pose -pose animation. In traditional animation, pose-to-pose -pose refers to drawing out a character in the main positions he or she is going to be in, and then later filling in the positions in between. Now we can use pose to pose animation when we're building complex interactions in Webflow. So the first tip that you can use is to simply start at the end and build your animation backwards. For example, here we have this very, very complex animation. If you're wondering how we built this animation, we can see here that we have a simple grid component with color blocks inside. Now, if we look at how the interaction is structured, we're having this section over here, which is scrolling through view and it's serving as our trigger. So let's have a look at how this is animated. We have here our pose to pose animation. And as you can see here, we have here at the last keyframe at 100%, all the blocks set to zero, zero, zero. So we're moving that back to where it was originally. And then all we have to do is animate each one of these blocks and put them out of position on the first keyframe on zero. So you can see here that this block is at the start in this position and then later it simply moves into place. The next principle that we're going to look into is called overlapping action. Overlapping action refers to the offset between the body and its parts. For example, imagine a character sitting in a go-kart. That character is having really long hair. Now, when the go-kart accelerates quickly, the hair of the person stays behind. And that offset between the body and its parts is called overlapping action. In animated movies, you can see that principle and it's being even more exaggerated. You can see sometimes whole characters staying behind for a second and then being pulled and so on. Now, how does that translate to web design and UI components. Let's have a look at the same sidebar we looked earlier where we talked about squash and stretch. Here we have a great example of overlapping action. We added some links and as you can see, the links bounce in just a little bit later. So there's a little bit of an offset here. And also the same thing when this bar is collapsing, the links over here stay for just a little bit you can see that this animation doesn't happen at the same time. Now, this is very subtle here, so that's why I explained first with the exaggerated 
uh, example of the person in the cart. Now let's have a look how this is built. If we look at this button over here, which is the trigger for our animation, we're having this animation on the first click and the other animation on the second click. Essentially, the animations are built in the same manner. So you can see here that we have the size of the component, the sidebar. We can see here that we have the links, which are moved a little bit, and the opacity and the rotation of the button. So these are all the actions that are happening. And as you can see here, when the bar starts expanding, this sidebar link over here has a little bit of a delay. So it starts just a little bit later and it swings into the screen. Here, this effect is very subtle since the sidebar link is animated only 0.1 seconds later, but you can see that this effect plays out really nicely here. Our next principle is called slow in and slow out. This refers to easing. In the real world, most objects follow an eased motion path. Just imagine a tree falling, and as it falls, it gains momentum. It starts very slowly at the start, and then it accelerates quickly. Now, let's see how this applies to user interface animation. If an object moves linearly or the, the motion is abrupt, it seems lifeless and robotic. Just let's have a look at this animation over here where this card is moving up. Now, obviously, you wouldn't move the card up so much on hover. This is just exaggerated just to show the principle in action, but you can see that it looks somehow weird and it looks cheap in a way. Let's now look at the same card with easing applied. We can see that as we hover, we have the same animation, but it just looks so much smoother. If you're using Webflow, you don't have to worry so much about easing. Webflow applies easing on all of your CSS animations by default. However, if you're writing custom CSS or you're using a library for animation, make sure to add easing to most of your interactions. And our next principle is called arc. In the real world, most objects move in an arc. For example, if I'm waving at the camera, my hand is moving in an arc. If a ball is bouncing, it is bouncing in an arc. Also, if we get kicked in the butt by someone, the leg is moving in an arc. Now, let's see how this same principle applies to interface design. Let's see how we can use this to make our animations look better. So here we have this menu, and as you can see, if I click on it, these elements move in an arc. First, we have this circle that appears out of nowhere, and it moves down and left and it scales so it creates an illusion of arc movement also we have this secondary motion this sidebar link that pops in from the bottom and it contributes to that arc movement so it makes it feel like it's moving this way now in webflow you can actually move things in an arc for real this is just an illusion that seems like it's moving in an arc but if you want to move objects in an arc you can do that as well let's have a look at this square that appears out of nowhere if we scroll down here whenever it scrolls into view it moves in an arc and it gets into position here now the way to build this is first you have to go to 2D and 3D transforms and change the point of origin. So it's not here at the bottom, but we set it to 400% here. So the point of origin is somewhere down here. Now, if we now rotate this square over here, it's going to rotate in an arc. It's rotating around that point of origin. This already creates an arc movement. If you're animating a background, this works great. However, if you're having content inside of that div square, the content is going to rotate as well, which we might not want. It might look bad. Now, there's also another way to animate it so that you don't rotate your content. And here's how to do that. We're animating it by changing the scale property and by moving this square. So we're not rotating it. Let's have a look at how the interaction is built. So here we see that we're only changing the move and the scale property of that item. Now, 
you might be thinking, okay, if we're just changing the move and the scale property, how are we moving it in an arc? And the way to build this is first to set the point of origin, which I showed earlier, away from the item. And then all we have to do is change the scale property and make it swing to. Of course, the change and the move property, but we're swinging to that position. Now, swing to will make a slight overshoot and then things will go into position. So with swing to, we can create this really, really nice arc transition. Also, if you want to change the direction of the arc, you can simply select swing from here and look what happens. It comes in from the bottom. Now, of course, if you want to adjust the arc, you can also play with the point of origin. So these two are the two variables which you can add it to get the effect you want. Next, we have secondary action. Secondary action describes gestures that support the main action to add more character to the character animation. Now, having that in mind, how does this translate to user interfaces and to UI components? Now, here we have this simple FAQ, and we can see that if we click on this item, this is expanding. However, we're also having secondary action here. For example, we can see that this arrow here is turning as well and also the color is being changed to blue so this is a great example of secondary action in ui essentially all micro interactions are secondary actions and our last and most important principle is timing this principle states that the personality and nature of an animation are greatly affected by the number of frames inserted between each main action in traditional animation, this refers to the number of frames that are drawn between each main action. For example, the closer we have the frames to each other, the slower and smoother the animation will appear to be. Let's just imagine for a second that a hand is coming from outside the screen and it's slowly hitting my head and moving forward. If the hand is moving slow, it will seem like the hand is trying to adjust my hair. On the other hand, if the hand moves really, really fast and our head bounces, it will feel like we just got hit by a hand. Now, in interface design, we don't really work with frames like in traditional animation, but we can still use timing to make our interactions look and feel much smoother. Timing is perhaps the most important of all of these principles. Timing not only helps us stage the content, but it also helps the user understand what's going on. For example, if we apply a hover animation to a button and this hover animation is taking a second or two, the user might not even notice that the button is clickable. If we reduce the transition to 300 milliseconds or below, the user will know exactly what's going on. Usually, most interface animations like hover states and feedbacks lie anywhere between 200 and 400 milliseconds. On the other hand, some more complex animations and transitions can take up to 600 milliseconds or more. Note that this does not apply to animations that happen while we're scrolling in view. The length of the animation or the interaction really boils down to the experience that you're trying to create for your audience. Now, what should you do if you feel like your timing is off and you just don't know how to fix it? If that's the case, you can always check how others resolve the same issues. Some great places to check for UI animation references are first the Webflow showcase page and existing design systems. You can check out Material Design and Carbon where you can find formulated specifications for each transition. Also, if you are a good observer, you can also look for references on pages like Dribble and Behance and so on. Now that we covered all of these incredibly useful principles, it's important to note one thing. Don't try to apply all of these principles on each and every interaction that you're building. Instead, think of these principles as secret spices. Whenever you see that applying one or two of these principles would make the interaction look really delicious, then use some of your secret spice. If you enjoy this type of content, then hit that subscribe button so that we can notify you when we release a new video. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.